appreciate the introduction. And uh, I think, uh, you know, over the years, you kind of present different places. Some of the stuff is outdated. I'm, I've been promoted since to associate professor. So, you know, you don't want to do all this and still stay at the same spot. So hopefully things have moved forward since. Um, it is a true pleasure for me to be here. This is not the first time I've, I met with the, uh, uh, in a meeting like this with the, with the foundation uh, sponsoring uh, uh, people coming here from different uh, areas of work, uh, some patients and families. And so it is an interesting uh, way to present to a wide audience that have, first they have the interest in the, in the issue obviously, but from different angles. And it makes it uh, somewhat challenging uh, the, the task to make sure that the, the language that I speak is, is acceptable to everybody and it's clear to everybody. But so if I deviate in any way, you can stop me and I clarify things. So I, I don't want you to feel that you have to learn any jargon I say without clarification. So um, let me just see if this is working. So the big green button got us to move. This is going back. Nope. All right. And it's, uh, I think there's, yeah, the red, perfect. Okay. So the, the, um, the area of work that I ended up in, uh, so I, I always like, you know, behavior and, and brain and, and how they interact. Uh, so from medicine to neuroscience to psychiatry to neuropsychiatry, uh, the, the, my journey continued to be toward uh, looking at the issues that come um, in neurological disorders that are under cognitive and behavioral and, and emotional symptoms. Um, this field is not, uh, very well defined because you can see, you know, hear people talking about biological psychiatry, which is really looking at the the changes in brain that happen in illnesses like depression and in schizophrenia. Uh, but I'm really interested more in in people who have neurological disorder uh, like Parkinson disease and how uh, they may manifest changes in cognition and, and behavior. Uh, so with with the group in in London, uh, like Dr. Jog and 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 others, uh, we, we've been always uh, collaborating to actually help people who show up in the movement disorder clinic with either cognitive or behavioral symptoms, and they come to my clinic at Parkwood, and we try our best to clarify what's going on and try to uh, help. But our focus today, obviously, on, on cognitive changes or what they have termed Parkinson's disease dementia and how, how we understand that and how we, you know, we can manage or help that illness. So, you know, the, the earlier description of Parkinson's disease by James Parkinson in 1817 did not really think about cognition as part of the illness because obviously, as you know, Parkinson's disease is known to the public uh, as a motor disorder and you see, uh, you know, tremor and, and slowing down and, and rigidity. Uh, but uh, James Parkinson did point out that uh, in, in toward the end, in kind of more advanced stages of Parkinson's disease, uh, constant sleepiness and slight delirium, which is a term obviously that indicate a cognitive change. That's something that could happen in later stages of Parkinson's disease. Um, now, what is the current understanding of the uh, epidemiology or you know, how, how common Parkinson's disease dementia or cognitive change in Parkinson's disease? So if you look at the, the full syndrome, this is talking about somebody who develop a full picture of dementia, you know, something that will, will be like similar to Alzheimer's disease, but and I'll tell you why it's going to be different, but, but still, we call it dementia as a common name. So about one-third of people with Parkinson's disease at any given time, so if you sample, you'll have one-third that will have a dementia in addition to the Parkinson's disease. Uh, if you go to a, a clinic that has the focus of dementia, so treat people with Alzheimer's disease and others, uh, about, you know, three to four percent of them will have Parkinson's disease dementia, meaning that it's not the most common form of dementia that we see in memory clinic. Definitely, we see Alzheimer much more. We see vascular dementia much more. We see uh, Lewy body dementia, which is obviously somewhat related, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the difference. We see frontotemporal dementia. So, so just to, I mean, this is a common uh, question I get from patients, like what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? Well, dementia is basically, from, from the name, it's dementia. Mentia is the menta mentation or the ability to think. Dementia is losing what you've had acquired before. Uh, so it's really a common term that you can use for different form uh, of, of, dem of dementia. And, so they're not different from Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is one form of dementia that have certain uh, you know, pathologies, certain characteristics. Parkinson's disease could result in a form of dementia as well, but it's not the most common one. As I said, you know, it is about uh, three to four percent of patients who are diagnosed with dementia. Um, so, but the, the, the important issue is that people with Parkinson's disease are at a higher risk of developing dementia. So if you 
take a sample of, of people and say, you know, in this age group with this level of education, what is your chance to develop dementia as, as a person? Well, people with Parkinson's disease have higher risk, about six times higher risk of developing dementia. So we know we need to be very uh, proactive and try to first, you know, see what can we do to, to prevent, but also if it develops, can we actually mitigate some of the challenges that come with that? So we don't consider this as a trivial issue when it comes to Parkinson's disease clinics because it is a high risk that we have to look at. And one other issue that with time, the risk continue to increase. So there's some studies that looked at, you know, following people for eight years and 15 years, and they estimated that people will continue to um, have an increased risk over time. So accumulative risk is up to 78%. But what makes people at risk? So if somebody developed Parkinson's disease in their 30s, and we know that there are some cases that develop uh, Parkinson even earlier, there's actually a juvenile type of Parkinson's disease that can, you know, it doesn't translate to having dementia 10 years later. It, age is a factor. So, and because we are obviously, as you know, we're an aging population and we have more people uh, with Parkinson's disease at an old age. So age is definitely one of the risk factors that make people develop. So if I develop Parkinson's disease in my uh, 70s, my risk of developing dementia by my 80s is higher because now I'm getting older with Parkinson's disease. Right? So keep that in mind. It's not just the duration of the illness, it's actually age. And there are some characteristics of the Parkinson's syndrome that makes us more likely to develop uh, dementia. We don't know if it is because the illness from the beginning has that characteristic or not. So if somebody has more the classic kind of tremor type of dementia, they're not at high risk as those who present mainly with rigidity, with difficulty with balance. So uh, clinicians uh, in the room who have seen people with Parkinson's disease, when they see a syndrome of more rigidity, imbalance, gait problems, they probably keep in the back of their mind that this might be something else. This might be just, not just Parkinson, Parkinson plus. And we have to keep that in mind when we assess people. So again, the, the issue is uh, aging, characteristic of the syndrome, but it is an important issue, I hope, that you've seen from this slide. It's not a trivial issue for the Parkinson's disease, and we need to keep it in mind and try to be on the look for it. Again, this is just to tell you that we are an aging population and we'll have more people above 65. So to, to point out to you that you, the person is in the middle of all this. They present with motor symptoms, they present with psychiatric symptoms, but they also present with cognitive symptoms. So it is really a triad that we think about. And today we're gonna focus on the cognitive issue. In my clinic, I usually see these uh, two issues much more. And, and the reality is that these issues are much more disabling than the motor symptoms. When people look at what makes people more unhappy, more uncomfortable, less functional, it's actually the psychiatric and the cognitive symptoms. They're very important to take in, into account. While we know much more about the motor symptoms, these issues are very important. I'm gonna say a few words again, for, because it's a mixed audience, I wanna be very basic in my description. So when we talk about cognitive function, most of us talk about memory, and memory is a, is a big term, so you know, I, I'm forgetting. Well, that means a lot of things uh, to different people. So the first thing, though, that we care about when we see people with cognitive concern is are they alert? Are they able to stay awake? Because one of the problems that when you try to assess somebody uh, who have a problem with, with alertness, you, you're not getting an accurate picture. I think we have a, a, a geriatrician in the room, so delirium is an illness that, that makes people go in and out of you know, awareness, and then it becomes difficult to conclude what is their actual cognitive function. So we usually look at alertness. Are they alert? Are they able to stay awake during the assessment? And the second issue is that uh, language. You know, we do a lot of our testing through language, you know, through asking people to say certain things, remember them later. So if, if the person have problem with language, let's say somebody had a stroke that affect their ability to make words in their mind, well, I can't really rely on a verbal kind of test. Yeah, so we need to make sure that the person is understanding us and able to express themselves. So once we take care of the, these two issues, then we go into the domains of cognitive function that we assess. So you can see it's not just one thing. So memory, which is usually the complaint that we hear, has different components. There's the working memory when the person is keeping information in mind just for a few seconds while they're multitasking, right? And this is an important issue because when I tell you, you know, keep in mind that we're going to be taking a turn after three, you know, uh, exits. Well, you have to keep that information while you're keeping some other information. And you don't, you don't need to hold on to that information forever because, you know, unless you're going to go back to that. So, so working memory is a brief 
uh, you know, something that you keep only because you want to may have, have a continuous process of, of, uh, of thinking and, and functioning. Episodic memory is when you say, so what did you do this morning? What did you eat this morning? Well, I'm now two hours ago, I was able to do it. So something that you can keep in mind a bit longer. And of course, there's the, the longer term type of memory to say, you know, what year, you know, Second World War happened? Who was the leader of that country? So there are some things that are older information that you can keep and, and have some. Uh, and then there's also semantic memory, which means my understanding of what a projector is, you know, a projector is a word that represents set of information that will allow me to describe. A projector is a device that does this to, you know, so there are, there are different types of memory. So I, I don't think you should remember <laughs> all that stuff, but just, you know, know that when we assess memory, we assess it from different angles. It's not just one thing, because that will help us understand what's happening in the brain. And there's differences between different forms of dementia, between Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's dementia in terms of what is the change, right? The, the other very important issue for Parkinson's disease is executive functioning. So executive functioning is your ability to say, what does it take for me to go from here to the airport to catch my flight at this time? Um, and what do I need to do before that? You know, I have a dog and I have to make sure that somebody can take him out. So that organization, sequencing of events, and you know, how it requires a lot of work that we take for granted most of our life. But as you develop illnesses like Parkinson's disease, you start feeling, you know what, it's not as spontaneous and as easy as it used to be, and I need to make sure now I make it a bit more manageable for myself. So executive function is an example of something that requires a lot of processing. Uh, visual spatial uh, function is like when you look at the ability of the person to say, you know, I'm standing here, how can I get there? You know, that ability to actually uh, use your visual information to, to get you from one spot to the other, but also some other sensory modalities, knowing if I put a coin in your hand, it's a coin. So there's a lot of things that are related to sensory perception. And praxis is basically the motor function but it's not the motor function that, that we talk about in Parkinson's disease, which is I'm um, slowed down and I have rigidity. It's more things that I've learned to do. So for example, if I uh, learned how to button my, my shirt, that's a praxis because there's a certain set of movements that I'm doing to do that. And losing that, that's, we call it apraxia. Or, and believe it or not, this is something that people with Parkinson's disease get exposed to is that your walking is affected by Parkinson's disease because you slow down, your legs are not as fast, but there's another form of impairment in, in, in walking which is called apraxia of gait, meaning that your, the set of things that you do spontaneously to walk and adjust if the environment change can be affected. And so you see people that look like as if they have Parkinson, but it's not Parkinson, it's actually an injury to the parts of the brain that has to do with regulating movement. So we, in the clinic, we actually look at this and say, is this really a Parkinsonian gait, like a slowed down gait, or is it actually a praxia of gait? Because we may discover that there's some you know, stroke that happened that people did not diagnose that has something to do with, with, the, with walking. Is this making sense to people? Just make sure that I'm not... Okay, so that's the basic idea. So you come to the clinic for a cognitive assessment. We're thinking at least, this is the basic starting point. There's more and more sophistication, but this is actually the basic idea. What areas you're affected? And, and how we can, uh, now, why is this, this is even important? Well, it's not an academic interest uh, only. I mean, obviously people like to understand what the brain does, but uh, for you uh, and, and for a person who's living with Parkinson's disease, it's a function. This is, this is what's gonna turn the wheel in your life, get you to actually do things, and you wanna make sure that you have all the resources available to you to make your decisions and quickly respond to changes in, in your life, right? So that's what we care about. You know, academically we're inter interested in understanding what happened in the brain, but in reality, I care about how this is going to affect your function. So the, the kind of cognitive changes that happen in Parkinson's disease. Now, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is a, the kind of the Bible of psychiatry. It's a, it's a consensus statement. It's, it's like when you, the American Psychiatric Association years and years ago said, we keep saying, oh, this is this, this is that, and but we just don't have a good validity. Like, what does that mean? So they got together several committees and say, what do we call depression? And they say, well, if you have these symptoms, five symptoms over, and they validated it as much as possible through practices, through studies. So they also have something to say about cognitive change or dementia, right? They changed the term, uh, 2013, to call it neurocognitive disorder. So basically saying it's something that has to do with the neurosystem, the brain, and it has to do with cognition. So in Parkinson's disease, if you look at that book now, it says there's you know, mild um, neurocognitive disorder, 
which another term is used for that is mild cognitive impairment. And there's one that's called major neurocognitive disorder, which is really dementia, the, the way that you use called dementia. The mild neurocognitive disorder is that something that you may actually live with uh, from the very beginning in Parkinson's disease or soon after you have, because it's really a change in, in some of the functions, uh, your cognitive function, that will not affect your ability to do things as much. But you know you had to adjust a little bit more. You're not as fast. And so, now, not everybody will have that, but, but usually if somebody says, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit slowed down in my me memory, I need uh, people to repeat things a little bit more, but I still can do things. You know, I can still drive, I can still you know, do my, I just take more time, it takes more effort, I need a bit more help. So that's mild cognitive impairment or mild neurocognitive. The major neurocognitive disorder is actually when the person meet criteria for a syndrome that actually affect the quality of function and, and the quality of, uh, of life. And I'll tell you more about that syndrome and how is it defined in Parkinson's disease. Because uh, it's not as talked about as much, but in, hopefully in, in, uh, the more and more we understand about that, we can, we can uh, spread the awareness. Why does this happen? Again, without going too much, you know, you've probably heard from uh, other talks, it's challenging to go from one side to the other, so I don't want to ignore one side of the room or the other. But um, so in, in, uh, in Parkinson's disease and in Lewy body disease, this, this is what they call Lewy body. Lewy body is basically accumulation of a, a protein that is misfolded, that has a, the wrong structure. The, this, this protein calls alpha siniculine, main, but it's actually a protein that we have in our brain that when it actually changes structure, it starts accumulating in the brain. And when things accumulate in the brain, like Alzheimer's disease, they have, you know, they have amyloid, change in the amyloid structure, they have you know, change in tau, other protein. But in, in Parkinson's disease, it's uh, what they call Lewy body. In, in the very early stages, when it's Parkinson's disease alone, that change happened in an area of the brain called uh, substantia nigra, in the back of the brain. And that affects the supply of dopamine to your you know, motor center, so you get slowed down. But then as the disease progresses and the person getting older, again, age is important, you may see more spreading of this protein to other parts of the brain affecting cognitive function and, and behavioral function, okay? So that's, that's really what we understand, uh, you know, when you actually see people's brains, uh, people die of accidents and they had Parkinson's disease, they've looked at their brain, and people who are generous to donate their brain when they pass away from other reasons, we were able to learn more and more about, about the kind of pathology. Now, the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, like amyloid, also happen in Parkinson's disease, but it's hard to attribute the illness to it because it's the amount is, I mean, we all know that amyloid accumulate in anybody's brain with aging. Uh, the amount and the distribution is, is different for Alzheimer's disease. So you may see some amyloid in Parkinson, but the main pathology is what they call Lewy body protein that I, I pointed out to you here. Now, how do you diagnose Parkinson's disease dementia? Or, so a group got together uh, 2007, the, the committee, and they say, okay, well, if we see somebody who had Parkinson's disease for minimum one year, so you have Parkinson's disease without cognitive impairment, without dementia for at least a year. Now, this has been debated. The longer, the better, of course, because then you know that this is a Parkinson's disease for long enough time. But they said minimum one year. And then you have what looks like a dementia, like Alzheimer's disease. You have something that starts slow, progress slowly, and affect uh, more than one area of cognition, so let's say memory and executive function, and that this is a change from your baseline. So two years ago, you didn't have this problem, now you have it, and that it affects your function. It's not, it's not just a trivial thing that you can compensate for. So if you have those, those are the core features, right? This is different from Lewy body disease, which you might have heard about, where a person may, may develop the Parkinson and the cognitive change around the same time either one before the other, but it's really within the same uh, period of time. So then you know this is an illness that's starting from the beginning in a widespread in the brain, not starting, as I described earlier, in, one, uh, in, in the substantia nigra area. And there are some features that kind of you know, support your understanding that this might be Parkinson's disease. So some of the associated features, for example, that the type of change in cognition is more toward executive dysfunction compared to people with Alzheimer's disease. So if I have a score of, let's say, 20 on, on a scale out of 30, uh, and I have Parkinson's disease, dementia, and somebody who have the same score, Alzheimer's disease, you tend to have more executive 
area of uh, and visual spatial impairment in people with Parkinson's disease. So the clinician who's assessing will say, oh, this is, a, this is different. You know, there's a bit of more problem with problem solving and, and the speed of thinking compared to somebody with Alzheimer's disease. So we think about that. And sometimes you do more detailed testing to confirm that. But also behavioral features, which is obviously an area that, that comes closer to my area of work, because people who develop significant change in their behavior, and that could be apathy, where the person has just you know, had Parkinson's disease, continue to do things, and then you know, two years later, they start just not feeling like doing anything, and not that because they're necessarily depressed, they just say, ah, what's the point? I'm comfortable staying at you know, home and do nothing. And their family, uh, spouses, kids, will be upset about that. It's like, you know, well, why? I mean, we, we can go out, we can have fun, we can do this and that. And the person just don't get that excitement about it, not because they're upset, just because they just don't feel like it. It's a, so that's different from what follows, which is change in mood. When the person is upset, negative, you know, irritable, not wanting, you know, like any noise in the house. So we get a lot of those pictures, say it's a personality and mood change, or actually a full-blown depression when the person actually is really down, sad, don't want to live anymore, they just don't feel like there's a point. So we have to do all this work in the clinic because there's different treatments for, the, for these symptoms, right? So anxiety, depression versus somebody who just, you know, leave me alone and I'm fine, that's different. Like if I give an antidepressant for the one who, you know, want to be left alone, may not make much difference, but if I treat anxiety and depression with an antidepressant or anti-anxiety medication, we're gonna see some difference. And then hallucinations. So hallucinations are very important. So somebody who did not have hallucinations. Now, let's start by saying that medication that we use to treat Parkinson's disease can induce hallucinations. But usually, when, when, when that happens, usually they're fleeting, shadows, some, you know, maybe an image in the middle at night. And the person will be able to tell, that eh, this is not real, something that passed through, and I think it's probably related to my medication. In Parkinson's disease dementia, when the person starts saying, you know what, I'm seeing these people in my bedroom in the middle of the night, and I'm not sure what they're doing there. Now, you know, as a person, you're not used to have this experience. I mean, if you develop an illness like schizophrenia early in life and you have it, then people say, okay, well, that's an episode of your illness. We can find something to help you with. But if you never had that experience before, it's so alarming to you, to your family. So I'll give you an example. I treated a, a man who had Parkinson's disease for 20 years, and he developed it relatively early, like in his 40s. Um, and, you know, he, he was okay with his Parkinson. It was progressing, and he was having more problems with movement. But at one point, uh, he was he's a very polite guy and very proper. He was telling his wife, it's like, I'm not sure why are you not serving this person who's sitting on the table with us. And, and then his wife was thought he was joking, and she dismissed it. But then they start showing up in his bedroom, then start showing up in his bathroom where he couldn't actually pee because these guys are standing there watching him and he can describe them in details. Now when you see this, this is actually a change in the person's uh, you know, illness. It's no longer just Parkinson's disease. That's the, so then we started investigating and sure enough it was a Parkinson's disease dementia. And then you have to do things that I'll describe to you. Like What do you do to actually help? So behavioral change that happened. Now, one thing I wanna make sure that you don't forget that if this change happened very quickly over like a few days, Typically, it's a result of something we call delirium, as I mentioned earlier, where a person, let's say, develop an infection of some sort, or you know, got dehydrated, their sodium went out of control, they took medication over the counter. So we need to make sure that this is not a change because of a delirium. If it is a steady, insidious change and persistent change, that usually indicate uh, more uh, dementia. So in the clinic, that's what we do. We try to understand the course of it, what happened before, what factors. Um, is that making sense to people? Yeah. All right, so, so far we've, we've learned about what would make you think about Parkinson's dementia, what would support it. There are some features that will actually make you less certain. You know, like, so for example, if I have somebody who had a stroke before, uh, or I look at their image and I see that they had a lot of small minor strokes that maybe could explain this, this feature. So I, I become less certain this is part of Parkinson's disease dementia. Uh, or if the person is actually, you know, Again, develop the, the motor change and the cognitive change very close to each other within, within like six months or so, then I think, oh, maybe it's Lewy body dementia. Um, things like, like depression, things like, so there's uh, things that are related to other illnesses that could explain it, will just make me more, less certain that this is Parkinson's di disease dementia, right? So it's not, all, I mean, people who work in clinics, we know things are not always straightforward. We have to consider other options. Okay.
Um, so then, you know, how certain are you will translate to probable versus possible Parkinson's disease dementia, right? So if, if I know I have all the features, all the core features, I don't have anything else to confuse me, then I'll call it probably probable Parkinson's disease dementia. If I'm less certain, I call it possible, and I will continue to keep an eye on, on what's happening to the person. So this is basically how we diagnose it in the clinic, right? It's not rocket science, it's just understanding, you know, now, to get there, though, you need a lot of work. You need, you need to work with the patient directly, with the family, with making sure that other doctors who've seen this person before who might have added some medication that might have confused us even more. So we have to be careful about not making assumptions. So we actually do quite a thorough, detailed assessment. So what do we do with the assessment? Well, I mean, obviously, I, I start by getting all the documentation. I interview the patient, interview the family, um, and then try to understand medical medication, psychosocial history, because what if this person had an illness that people did not tell me about, like bipolar illness, which is a mood disorder that can present with depression and psychosis, you know, hallucinations, or schizophrenia, or they have been drinking too much for a long time and they have a different form of dementia that's related to that. So you need to do a very thorough assessment and you do a physical exam, a neurological exam. In the neurological exam, of course, you try to detect, you know, you know what Parkinson looked like, you know what this person's Parkinson looked like, well, but what if you're picking up on a change in there? So there's a weakness in one side of the, of the, of the, of the body. It kind of points you to the possibility of a stroke. Uh, there's a possibility of this person actually having um, an infection somewhere. Now, once we do that, then we go to cognitive testing to try to understand, like, what is the profile of, of, of cognitive function for this person? So we do something in the clinic, and we do something a little bit more details if we need to with a, with a neuropsychologist. And some investigations, a lot of the investigations are really ruling out other things. So there's no diagnostic test for Parkinson's disease. But let's say I want to make sure that this person doesn't have low sodium, doesn't have, you know, uh, severe anemia or hypothyroidism or, you know, or brain imaging if I suspect that there's a vascular event like a stroke uh, history. So cognitive testing, you know, you, you might have been yourself exposed to it if you're a patient in, 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 uh, in movement disorder clinic or a geriatrician clinic or psychiatry clinic. So people will say, okay, well, now that I've heard the story and I try to understand it, I'm gonna actually do a test to see what's your function like. We call it bedside or clinic-based testing. And also I usually ask for function. So there are some questionnaires that we give families to, to ask for how much this person can do now and, and can't do. And then some behavioral screening to see what are some of the behavioral symptoms so that we can reach a good understanding. So it's always there's a person in the middle of all this, and there's so many factors, biological, psychological, and social factors, and there's also a context, so, you know, like where is this happening? So if I get the referral from a person home, I know that I need to understand what, what is it, why now? Why, why is this a concern now? Well, if, if I hear from the spouse that so-and-so is waking up in the middle of the night and thinking that there's some people outside, then that's different. Now I can get the referral to some people from long-term care, from, from a long-term care facility when, when they say, so-and-so is refusing to take any medication because they think that they, we're poisoning them, or they're seeing people coming to their room at night and they're upset because that's a private room. So you have to think about wh why this matters to anybody, right? Where is it coming from? So as a management, so what do we do to help people? Well, first, I want to assure people, because without assuring people, without making sure that if I don't convince you that I'm on your side, like if you're experiencing something that's so profound and life-changing and I'm not coming across as somebody who's supportive, you're probably not going to even trust whatever else I'm going to suggest. So we build a lot of good alliance with people. We try to also take care of medical legal changes, meaning that how safe is the situation is. So is this person driving, and if they're unable to know where to, where to turn, well, that's gonna create a, a risk for accident. So this is a very sensitive issue for most people. You know how, how important it is for people to drive, but it is a privilege that you earn. Uh, you know, obviously, you're not born with that right. You have to acquire it. So when you get to the point where you drive and you have been driving safely and have no problem with your driving record, and all of a sudden you see a doctor who say, you know, I'm gonna have to send a note to Ministry of Transportation because I'm not sure how safe are you to drive. The first reaction would be like, you regret the minute that you decided to come to that clinic and you hate this doctor who's telling you, you know. But I wanna make sure you understand where this is coming from. The problem is, it's really calculated risk in terms of how much risk you're taking by, by driving. How much I know in the clinic is very little. Like I don't know how, how much, how, how safe are you to drive. You may drive another 20 years without an accident. 
But what we rely on is some of the statistics that show us that people who develop an illness like dementia, you know, added to the Parkinson disease, added to the visual impairment, as, they are at much higher risk of getting into accidents. So I'm not going to be fair to you if I don't tell you that, you know what, your driving today is much less safer than it used to be. And I don't know how to estimate that risk, but I'm going to send you to for some kind of testing or ask the Minister of Transportation to do some, something about it. The problem is that the Minister of Transportation has only one quick solution, which is stopping your license. And then they say, OK, well, let's investigate it first. Don't drive, right? So there has been some situation where I'm comfortable that the the, the patient and the family have been very clear that oh, we understand your concern. We're not going to, you know, drive until we, we sort this out. We go to a test, like a drivable test or another test. So it's important for you to know that this is where it's coming from. It's not, and the, the law in Ontario is very strict on that. It's like if any practitioner has, um, you know, diagnose or identify a problem that may, just may interfere with driving that we have the obligation to report. So a lot of time we take risk, we don't report immediately because we think that, okay, well, we'll work with you to see if we can find a solution first to find out are you really safe or not safe. So that's one issue that we really have to address in the clinics and then hopefully that will make you next time less upset when people talk about this issue. I think it has to be talked about openly. Uh, issues with safety home in terms of, you know, things could burn on the stove because you don't remember or you get distracted easily because if you have a problem with your attention and you can't think about two things at the same time, so you have something on the stove and somebody call you, you may forget what's on the stove. Uh, the capacity in terms of like, we love for people to continue to make their own decisions to the last, you know, chance possible. But that sometimes get affected by, co by cognitive changes. So capacity to make decisions about your treatment, capacity to make financial decisions, because think about the amount of, of, of thinking and, and information you need to make sure that the decision is sound. Uh, luckily, sometimes if you have a good support, they will help you make that decision. And we don't like to take people's right to make decisions, but there's also a principle which is not causing any harm. So if I prescribe anything to you, and I'm not sure how capable are you of understanding the risk and benefit, I need to make sure that somebody who have that ability will lend that to you. Like, so somebody that you trust will sit with you and say, you know, I understand you're proposing this treatment. It has the risk of fall. It has the risk of this and that. So we do those capacity assessments as well. And the issue with abuse is something that we really care about. Is like, there's several types of abuse that, that people get exposed to by virtue of aging, but also by virtue of illness. Financial abuse is something that we are getting more and more concerned about because people can reach your home very easily now through the internet. You need the internet to reach the world if you're not mobile, but the internet can reach you in, in, in a harm way. And I've seen people who have been unfortunately vic victims for abuse where somebody sent them, you need to clean up your computer and they click and they put their credit card and they keep cleaning that computer every day. And, and unfortunately, that's money that's drained from, from the, the, what you earned all, all your life. So, and then the other issue that I think we have not addressed, because this is not the topic today, is impulse control issue that happens with Parkinson's disease in general and with Parkinson's dementia, where a person actually could be impulsively or compulsively shopping online, and, and now you become open to be victimized by all kinds of agencies who want your money, right? So, so we, we really, have, now this is only one type of abuse. I've seen other abuse, for example, neg neglect, like somebody would say, you know what, you're in your room, I'll do everything, and then you're locked up in your room, and you're like, so you have to make sure that a person who have this illness of Parkinson's disease, dementia, is not being neglected, it's getting all the care that they need and not being abused. Physical abuse I've seen as well, when the person is just yelling out, asking for help because they're disadvantaged. So we, re we have to make sure that we're prepared for all the possibilities, and only by sitting with you and with your family or with your team in long-term care, we understand all the aspects that will help us prevent those. We do a lot of caregiver giver intervention, and that includes, of course, the Parkinson Foundation, Alzheimer's Society. There's a lot of resources that will get you to understand what you're going through, some supportive um, care, issues about placement and respite care, when a person is actually not doing well and, and their spouse or their kids want to just take a little break. So really, my advice to you, and that's what I do in the clinic, activate every single possible support you can access. because. There's not enough to start with, and if you don't access that support, but it has to be, of course, needed. It has to be reasonable. Uh, so, you know, I think you need that support. Don't, don't, don't shy of asking for it because you, you deserve it. So how do we treat these illnesses? Well, unfortunately, there's uh, 
few things that we can do to prevent it. I mean, there's probably uh, some trials started and, and try to prevent the illness from happening. Dr. Steve Pasternak in, in, in London is doing a trial to look at um, preventing the development of Parkinson's disease dementia it's still in infancy. But it is interesting to see that if we can actually stop that signal. So if you have Parkinson and we know you're at that high risk, if we give you this medication, it's actually a cough syrup from, from Europe that's now being studied, could we stop this from developing into a dementia? This is happening as we speak. But in general, we advise people to do you know, li lifestyle modification because if you have Parkinson's disease and you want to prevent further damage to your brain, well, take care of some of the risk factors like high blood pressure, like issues with uh, control your diabetes and not smoke. And there's a lot of things that you can do to at least maintain what you have and stay active as much as possible because this illness comes with apathy. So you're tempted not to do anything, but then not to do anything will just get you to decline more and more. And then symptomatic treatment. So we treat what we consider treatable, like depression is treatable uh, in, in, in this illness. So we try to kind of address that. Uh, hallucinations are treatable, but I'll tell you there's a bit of risk treating them, so we have to be very careful. Adjusting current therapy. So somebody who is on Parkinson medications you have to balance between how much movement symptom improvement you want and how much hallucination you have to deal with. So sometimes we have to change the timing and, and lucky for, for us, I mean, I work with, with Dr. Jog and Dr. Jenkins and, and Penny McDonald in, in London and I sometimes tell them, okay, I'm gonna be adjusting the Parkinson medication and they're like, go ahead because they don't see people more than once a year, sometimes one of six months. And if I'm dealing with a syndrome like uh, intense hallucinations, they gave me the permission to start working on that stuff. And of course, I'm informed by their, um, you know, their prescription patterns. So I try my best not to affect the motor symptoms as much, but uh, we sometimes have to do that. And then cognitive enhancement, like what can we do to actually enhance cognition with medication? And of course, dealing with the behavioral symptoms. So let me show you the, the non-pharmacological intervention. I think we covered some of it in terms of support and, and psychological support and day program, adult day program, respite. But uh, Medication-wise, so there has been very little studies for the MCI, uh, like the mild cognitive change. Um, the best I can say that there's one study for atomoxetine. The, the evidence is, is weak. It's only a small study. Atomoxetine is a drug that enhances norepinephrine. It's a chemical in, in, in the prefrontal area, so it increases attention to some extent. But when it comes to Parkinson's disease dementia, the PDD or Parkinson's disease dementia, there has been some work on the drugs that we use for, for Alzheimer's disease. So rivastigmine uh, is a drug that has been studied the most. Uh, it has two forms, capsules that you take twice a day or a patch that's once a day. The patch is not covered under the formula, so it costs you some money. I, I forgot the last number, but uh, about 100 probably a month or so. But uh, unfortunately, we couldn't really convince uh, the government to fund it. It's very feasible. It's easy to use. So things that you worry about with this medication that uh, sometimes when you take it orally, it affects, makes people sick to the stomach or cause diarrhea. It may slow down your heart. Uh, sometimes actually there has been studies to show that there's more likelihood of have, needing pacemaker if you, if you end up on these medications. Uh, issue with uh, active dreams is something that I see. Uh, and uh, something we haven't spoke about that in Parkinson's disease, REM behavioral change, so when the person actually starts dreaming too much but also acting out their dream. So when that's a problem and I add a medication like this, I may worsen that phenomenon. So we have to be careful about that. So I always ask about active dreams and acting out your dreams because it is something that will affect the treatment outcome. Um, the other medications that are on the market, denipazil, which is Aricept and galantamine, Reminil, both have some evidence. I think denipazil has a bit more evidence. How do we choose between them? Well, because rivastigmine has a bigger study, it's the one that we, we start with. But I have seen people who did, did as well on, um, on the other medications. Um, it's not just to prepare you, it's not a dramatic improvement. There is a small portion that seemed to improve, especially with attention and, and the ability to be there and be uh, motivated. Uh, but I have seen people who just stay a bit longer in the same stage, and I had some other, maybe one third that does not see any benefit. It's a, so it's, it's one of those things. Now, if you are prescribed this medication, it's important to identify a target for treatment. So you, you, you should hear from your pr provider that one goal is to keep you in this spot as long as we can. So this is not, we're not gonna improve anything, but we're just gonna hold you here. If you get improvement beyond that, and you actually say, oh yeah, you know what, I'm actually thinking faster, I'm participating more, then that's, that's great. 
But if obviously if you continue to decline at the same expected rate, then we have to decide is this really worth it or not. Now sometimes with these medications, we get improvement on behavior. So hallucinations sometimes improve with the choline stays inhibitor. So there's a lot of details you have to discuss, but I think it's important to have that discussion. So what is the target and what are the risks that, that I'm taking with this? So just a few uh, discussions about neuropsychiatric symptoms, meaning the behavioral symptoms. So this is just a list of them. This is a scale that we use called neuropsychiatric inventory. It tells you like what are the symptoms. So things that I see a lot in Parkinson, depression, the apathy, hallucinations, some delusions, and then some general agitation and, and aggression as anxiety as, as well. So it's one of those things that, you know, a change in behavior that create, uh, and depend on the stage of the illness. Early in, this, in the illness, it's more anxiety, apathy, and, and depression. Later in the illness, more agitation and aggression. We've seen that in long-term care. Um, things that we think about when it comes to behavioral symptoms, of course, is this a manifestation of a need that, that we need to meet? So somebody who's bored, does not have much activity, and just pacing, and you know, that maybe that's their, their way of getting stimulation. If somebody asking the question repeatedly, well, that's because they don't remember what you told them. So you need to make sure that you have a me method. Sometimes people actually write it down and say, every time you want to ask about this, I'll just point you to that paper, say lunch is at this time and there's a clock next to it. So you really have to be very uh, individual in that approach, see what works for people. And then sometimes pain, discomfort, things that you have not uh, considered because the person is not expressing them openly. Uh, so medical issues like pain, constipation, infections, uh, not hearing, not seeing clearly. We have a lot of people who develop, you know, cataract, and that's correctable. But some people develop macular degeneration; it's not correctable. So you have to think about: Can I correct anything here? And then that will make things better for the person. And treating psychiatric issues. I mean, people who get depressed and frightened or, or have some symptoms. Um, this is a long list, but I'll just describe it in brief terms that when we deal with a behavioral thing, they call it a DICE approach, developed by Kale and her group. Um, you know, so first describe what is the behavior, what has changed, and when, and, and what triggers it, and what gets it better, and then investigate if there's any reason to believe that their pain, functional issues, medical conditions, all that stuff, is the caregiver under stress. So sometimes I see that this problem showed up in my clinic just because Finally, this, this uh, spouse is exhausted, and they just say, you know what, I'm not taking this one more day. And then you say, okay, what, what, why did we not think about helping this caregiver to actually have a bit of break now and then so that they don't reach that point? So sometimes the factor is not the patient being ch different, it's just the environment changing. Or, the, or actually one thing I see a lot in my clinic is that a caregiver get ill themselves. Like they have, they have cancer to treat or they have, and, and you know, it's amazing how little I hear or a C in the notes to describe that. And it's like, it's a system, you can't, if somebody lived with you for 50 years and they took care of you and all of a sudden they now facing, you know, a cancer or, or some major treatment they have to go through, well, the system has to address that issue. It's no longer just one patient, there's two now. Um, and then we create a plan to work with and then evaluate that plan over time. We, we treat, uh, behavior with, with medication sometimes. Uh, again, before that, we do everything possible to treat what's correctable. But some of the things that we have seen, uh, if we see depression, we treat. There's really no good trials of um, medication in, in Parkinson's disease depression. There's tricyclics or medication that we use in the past have very good evidence for depression in, in, in dementia. Uh, sorry, depression in Parkinson's disease. But when it comes to dementia, now you start worrying about them causing some cognitive side effects. So we use medication like venlafaxine. Um, which is uh, effects are in, in, in Ontario. For, again, for the hallucinations, it's a challenge because if I give the same medication that I use for people with, with schizophrenia, I cause the Parkinson to be much worse. People start falling more, they start dying more. I mean, there's a risk of death. With, so we need to be, be careful. So we don't treat them very easily with medication. And if we do, first we try by adding the, the cognitive enhancer like vestigamine. We, we uh, adjust the medication, like cinnamon, maybe cut it down in certain times, like later in the evening. Then we use maybe small dose of clozapine or Circuil. These are two medication that we have that are very... Now, sometimes the REM behavioral change, so this is when the person is dreaming and acting out a dream. Sometimes by doing, you know, a person waking up and they're still hallucinating, so by addressing this issue, it helps. So we use melatonin, which is, as you know, over the counter, cl clonazepam, very small dose because it also affects cognition. So, Again, those names, 
mean nothing unless you have the issue yourself. And, and, but I just wanted to, 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 to let you know that this is what we try to do in our clinic, is try to profile what's the problem, find solutions. So I want to give some time for questions. So to summarize, it's a common illness, Parkinson's disease, but it also has cognitive changes, and these changes are usually mild and, and, and manageable. The dementia itself happened in about one third, and again, age is a factor. Um, usually with advanced age, with severe motor, non-motor symptoms, uh, like behavioral changes, and then functional behavioral changes you sometimes signal a change from only Parkinson's disease to Parkinson's disease dementia. So I think that's probably good enough as an overview, and I'm open to your questions.